Hi everyone, good morning and welcome to another session of Horn Camp Connect live from KBHC 2023. Woohoo! We are on day four. My name is Nikki Labonte. I'm the Assistant Artistic Director of KBHC and your host for this illustrious Emmy winning program, TBD. I'm here with Shanice Strickland, who is a composer and freelancer. And some resume highlights include having a commission from the Seattle Symphony, and she's just finished playing on Broadway. So, Shanice, thanks for being here with us. We are super excited to have you. I'm so happy to be here. It's been such a wonderful experience, and I'm just really happy to be here. Yay, that's awesome. So today we're talking about horn in unfamiliar territory, exploring alternate genres. Talk to me a little bit about how you got started in these like alternate genres did was you know did you have like a, a traditional horn upbringing and then kind of branched off at some point or were you always like exploring this other side of horn playing so i did start off classically trained um you know i actually started off as a flute player mm. and made the very smart choice to horn because it's the best choice um yep, even right. though i still play a little bit of flute still but you know horn's my main thing and yeah um I really just wanted to combine what I was learning through the horn journey with what I grew up with. So my mom is like a really avid Prince fan, so go Prince. Um, and she always listened to hip hop, R&B, so a bunch of like, you know, funky, you know, jazz kind of genre. So I wanted to combine both of those worlds together because I love both of them like equally as much. Mm. And so, you know, I'm like, well, even though this instrument, you know, the Koprash, the the major scales and all the classical training, I'm like, I feel like I could still do the the things that I want to do on the horn that exist in other worlds too. And so I literally just started to try to figure it out. And it actually made me have a better relationship with my instrument because, you know, I do not have perfect pitch, but I have good relative pitch. And so like singing a lot of singing i love to sing mm -hmm. so singing and then picking up the horn and trying to emulate what i sung and that's that's kind of how it happened did you sort of figure it out on your own did you have somebody kind of guiding you through that process or were you just like you know hearing what hearing what you wanted to do and then figuring out how to do it i really didn't have any guidance in that regard um my band directors were like Again, one of my band directors were a flute player, another one was a bassoon player and, you know, classically trained and have any jazz background. And so it was just it was something I was really just motivated to do just because I wanted to do it. I'm an only child. So, you know, like instead of like playing outside with friends, like I was like in my room with my flute, with my horn, mm -hmm. you know, singing, listening to Prince records and then trying to play what I was hearing. So it was just like something personally that I just always gravitated towards. Yeah, and it's turned into a really substantial career for you. I mean, you know, like you, you've you like capitalized on these alternate genres and, and they're like, you know, paying the bills. Absolutely, Yeah. <laughs> literally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, you know, for anybody, like we all have to play some amount of alternate genres. Like, I don't think that you can get through a career in horn playing and not have to play jazz. You know, it's pops true. concerts, everybody plays pops concerts. Yep. I mean, and I, I love that you've explored that like to the umpteenth degree. I mean, I remember my first pops concert that I ever played, shout out to the Hawaii Symphony and those very tolerant musicians. <laughs> Africa by Toto was on that concert. Okay. And I didn't know the song. And so I'm sitting there and we have the chorus rhythm in the horns and I've got the metronome going and I'm just like tying out the rhythm. Ta, 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 Like that's it. And I spent yeah. so much time and like, I, I wish I had more exposure to that kind of music when I was a student and learning mm -hmm. because it would have saved me like two hours of score study on Africa by Toto, you know? Yes, right, literally. <laughs> So talk a little bit about how other students, how, how, you know, people who are up and coming on the horn or, or people who have spent a lot of time, but just want to start exploring other avenues on the horn. How can they um, get into this? How can they get into, you know, playing and, and, and doing what you're doing? So the first thing I would say is that like just being courageous enough to listen to other genres. Um, you know, since I've been here, I've had a bunch of different groups. And so everybody's coming from a bunch of different walks of life. And there's a few people 
But I asked, you know, so what else do you listen to outside of classical music? And they were like, I, I don't, you know, I mean, like, you know, hard, fast, like Mahler fan, the Wagner, the yeah. Beethoven. And so like, you know, I want to say that there's nothing wrong with just like completely being immersed in loving classical music. There's nothing wrong with that. But insert the big butt here. There are other genres of music that have certain elements that can be very beneficial to the genre that you choose to love being that classical music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always tell people, you know, a lot of my colleagues that are, you know, classical people, <laughs> if you will, they, they don't like hip hop, they don't like rap, they don't like the profanity, you know, all that other good stuff. There is rap and hip hop that exists that doesn't have any profanity in it. And so the thing is, is that, you know, again, the different elements that exist in these different genres, the rhythmical integrity that exists in hip hop is unmatched from any other genre that exists. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if trying to go over that, that rhythm that you had in Toto, if you were able to listen to just the actual song in its context, instead of having to look at the score mm -hmm. that is written out in a way that conveys only classical music right but it's about the feeling of it because if you sing if you sung it like that way it yep. would not be the same as how the song is in, in its real context mm -hmm. so i would say the first thing is that you have to try to listen to other genres if you only are familiar with classical music you know there's somebody in your life that has to know about another genre and then get suggestions from them mm -hmm. a lot of people like country music I'm not particularly a fan of country music, but the stories in country music, the melodies, the harmonies, I mean, like, it's almost something similar to jazz, mm -hmm. but in a very, like, watered down kind of way, but still, there's relevance there. Sorry, Garth Brooks, if you're watching. <laughs> right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, you know, the first thing is listening and then, you know, being comfortable, honestly, with your own voice. I know a lot of people... Again, I've met so many different personalities being here at the camp, and I love it because, you know, some people are like, I'll sing, and then they're just like, yeah, and then other people are like, I don't really want to sing at all, you know, like, and, and so it's just like, it's not about, you know, being the next Whitney Houston, like, you don't have to be a singer. I tell people all the time, I know how to sing, but I am not a singer. And so it's just like finding your own voice, like internalizing it, being able to produce the music that you hear around you. So then that when you put this big hunk of metal to your face, like there's some familiarity with it. So it's not just like you just like just taking something clearly out of the sky. Mm -hmm. So really my process with everything is listening like a bunch, like listening, listening, listening when I'm washing the dishes, when I'm going on a walk in between my nine to five and stuff like that, listening, then singing it because I listen to it so much. You know, that like earworm tune that you're just like, yeah. oh, and it's like, dang, I cannot stop singing this song. So getting it, internalizing it. And then when you go into your practice, after you've done, you know, the things that you're focusing on for gigs and things like that, taking a step away from the music and just, it's just you and the horn. And just focusing on that, all the stuff that you've been singing, the things that you've been listening to, and then putting it on the horn. You're not going to necessarily know what the notes are initially, but, you know, it's a part of being a musician. It's just ear training, right? Mm -hmm. So you should be able to, I don't want to say you should be able to, but if you take the chance and if you're courageous enough and you want to venture into this dangerous void, <laughs> you will, you know, it, but you'll find that and uh, it take me as an example and a bunch of other horn players that it'll make you a better musician. Totally. You know? Well, and you know, going off what you said about like how all of these other genres have valuable things, it's all connected, right? right. It all has slowly over time evolved from one thing to the other. And there are like, you know, elements of classical music that are in pop music yes. or hip hop or rap and, you know, vice versa, those mediums that influence con contemporary classical music. Mm -hmm. And so it's all interconnected and, and when you can like see that and draw those comparisons and like pick up on the musical language, you know, it's mm -hmm. hard to, it's hard to sometimes articulate all of that stuff and all of those nuances, mm -hmm. but there's definitely a language present in each genre that, you know, has a lot of commonalities with the other languages and you just have to spend time immersing yourself in that in order to get it. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So I really want, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to get on this, this train. I'm going to start like trying to explore alternate genres on the horn. 
it's really intimidating if I don't have any music to play. I'm what do sure. I do? If you don't have any music to play as far as like what you're trying to get into? Yeah, like if yeah. I if I want to start doing jazz on the horn, but I don't want to just like pick up a, you know, a jazz horn piece and, and start like and trying start. to like, you know, knock it out. Like, is there a way that I can kind of ease myself into that? Yes. So, you know, with jazz in comparison to other genres, as far as like actually studying it, mm -hmm. Again, it's kind of like honestly the same formula that I mentioned earlier, like you have to listen to it, like getting the feeling of it like in jazz rhythm is king over everything. It's like rhythm and then the harmony and then the ornamental all the, you know, all, right. all the stuff right. that you would think jazz would be even if you weren't used to listening to it. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, you know, just listening and internalizing the rhythm. Um, something that I do when I give jazz horn lessons, though, is, you know, there's also, again, like music theory. Oh, like you have to know your theory. You mm -hmm. have to know all of your scales and all 12 keys, because the thing about jazz is that the theory and the chord progressions are happening at a rapid rate. Mm -hmm. It's much, you know, it's much more complex and much more um, just, I guess I, I want to say immersive, but it's, it's much more involved i would say than our typical classical pieces to be honest so you know the two five ones that's like a big like i i want to say the the most if anybody's familiar with shankarian analysis when you you know take a bunch of different chord progressions and then you condense them to like literally one five one that kind of thing i feel like the two five one progression is that's kind of the same thing in jazz so you know doing your two chord, your five chord, and then your one chord in every single key. And um, something I do in lessons that we play the, going from the, the first note all the way up to the seventh note in every key. So, and then we go down a whole step. So, I mean, like, you know, put it again, putting your metronome on or using iReal Pro. That's an app for all the Apple people. Sorry, Android people. I don't know what to tell you. It's not on Android. Probably not. Get um, on it, iReal Pro executives. Right, right. <laughs> like, we want to make it usable for everybody. That's but right. iReal Pro, and it will provide a complete rhythm section for you. So, you get your bass, your piano and an actual click for you to play against. And so um, in in the app, they have like a bunch, all the jazz standards, and then they have a few exercises for you to play. So, you know, just like you play your major scales to warm up or to, you know, start a piece and stuff like that. Whenever I'm playing any kind of classical piece, I wanna play the scale that it's related to first mm -hmm. to just get like harmonically wise and just the tone of it. But you can do the same thing in jazz so that I would say that's the connection between like we were mentioning earlier, you know, some of the stuff that you do in your jazz practice is the same thing that you do in your classical practice too. everybody has to know all the different scales all 12 keys the different modes of the scales and you get into different intervals the whole tones the diminished scales to try all that kind of stuff that you have to study in music theory for classical training it's the same thing for jazz as well. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So I learn all my scales. Twelve or twelfth uh, grade Nikki is shaking in her boots because I hated the scale. So sorry, <laughs> but I've done it. I've faced my fears. I've learned all twelve of my major scales and all the other variations. What you know, technically, like we, you know, most of us and and you as well, like we spend so much time like learning how to play the horn in a classical sense and all of the technical things that come with that and what do we keep when we start playing jazz horn and what do we leave behind what do we you know pick up what do we sub out instead does that make sense yes yes so the main thing that i would say and i was thinking about this last night in my performance the main thing it's like it's a straight up mental thing mm. you know the horn on the horn up because of a bunch of different mechanical and technical things like a lot of times we miss notes, but in jazz, in that realm, that's okay. Mm. So losing the, the sense of having to be perfect with everything and playing exactly what's on the page 
in this genre, it's more important to capture the essence of what the music is actually trying to tell, opposed to playing every single note perfectly, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, I think that because of the, the lack of per perfectionism that you have to have in jazz, that there's this kind of conflict when it comes to classical musicians. Well, it's like, well, if you don't have to be perfect, then it's not as important of a genre as classical music. But that's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like the things that these musicians, John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, the things just like theoretically, if we were putting it in a Western European theoretical sense, the things that they just made up on the fly is like so intricate and it's amazing. I, I mean, like Giant Steps, Donna Lee, if anybody out there is like familiar with any kind of jazz, like those are the really hard pieces. And so, you know, just thinking about like in Mozart, when we have, you know, like, you know, the Sonata Allegro form and starting a theme and it being in a major key and going to fight, it's like those harmonies were not as complex at all. So the thing is, it's just like, yeah, it's just like losing, trying to like get outside of your comfort zone of having to play every single thing perfectly. And if you chip a note, fine. That's not the most important thing. Just like in classical music, when we say that putting the notes in the right spot is the most important, like, you know, it's secondary to if you play a wrong note, mm -hmm. but especially if you're playing in an ensemble, that note has to be in the right space, right? Yeah. Even if it's wrong, it has to be in the right space just so that you can keep the flow and the rhythmic integrity of everything. Yep. And jazz, that's really important, you know? And, you know, when in doubt, you can chromatically always find your way to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you can't necessarily do in classical music because you're bound to that piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And while there's security there, I always tell people, you know, like, you know, you're bound to that. Mozart wrote a script of what he wanted people to say. If you're thinking about it in terms of a conversation. So thinking of, of you, like, you know, we have in this conversation right now, it's pretty free, but think about if we actually had to memorize something it would feel much less personable. It wouldn't be actually what I, maybe what I wanted to say if Peggy like wrote everything that I needed to say or she <laughs> wanted me to say. And so there would be security. There's a teleprompter right under there. See? <laughs> <laughs> right, actually. <laughs> you know, but it's like, you know, me being able to use my own voice, there's freedom in that. Hmm. And, you know, sometimes people think that when you don't have structure, it's like, you know, it's scary, but if you're just courageous enough, you can find so much freedom and you, I feel like you're more comfortable in it. Mm. So I combine both worlds. And so that's, that's what makes up me. <laughs> that's awesome. It's, it's really, really interesting. Do you feel like technically, you know, like in terms of like articulation or, or things like that, you know, I, I feel like I'm certainly not an expert, nor do I claim to be so major disclaimer here, but you know, like when I hear a classical trumpet player and then when I hear a jazz trumpet player, like for me, like they almost sound like two entirely different instruments. The approach feels so different. How do you achieve that like difference in style on the horn? Right, right. So technically, um, uh, it's it's really just loosening up that very I have to be in the middle of the pitch all the time. Mm. It's weird because I, I think about music and colors and textures all the time. Definitely. So when I'm composing and when I'm playing too. So when I'm having to play the short call, I would imagine that all of the notes have to be directly in the center. There's no scoops. Everything has to be in tune. When you're playing jazz, you can still have everything being tuned, the intonation, but there can be a little less edge on the front of your articulation. I, when I'm playing my solos, when I'm playing jazz, I'm slurring everything just because I feel like because of my classical training, when I try to articulate anything swung, it starts to become what we would say square. Mm -hmm. I go into the do ba do ba do ba do ba do <laughs> instead of oh, ba yeah, ba da 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 da. It's something different, you know? Mm -hmm. So like kind of taking like laying back a lot with the articulation and then not being afraid to bend a note every now and then you know i think that like as horn players it's like no like it's already hard enough to just like make a note speak and let make it stable and make it sturdy but in jazz you don't have to do that all the time you know you can go back and forth but when i'm warming up i make sure that my warm-ups are structured 
so that I can go in and out of the world if I want to, but my base is always going to be something that is structured. I'm hitting all the pitches in the way that I want to, you know, so it's like you learn the rules in order to break them. Yeah, definitely. Well, and, you know, again, like going back to like the grand landscape of music, like that's always been the case, you know, Mm -hmm. like Mozart was a great composer because there were rules and he broke them and they're like way different than the rules now and the way people are breaking the rules. But Mm -hmm. there's always been like every creative or pioneer of any type of music or any, anything like art or anything. That's always like breaking the rules, like learning the rules and then learning how to break those rules in a way that makes sense, you Mm -hmm. know? So kind of going from that, why, you know, why is it important that I take the time? You know, I, I know like if I was, uh, hearing this um, conversation that we're having, and I was an undergrad, I feel so overwhelmed right. by everything that's going on. And everyone's telling me I should invest all this time in, in theory and, and in all of these other things to mm-hmm. make myself a better horn player. And also I have to practice and I'm trying to get a job and all of this stuff. Like, why is it a real important thing for me to take the time to explore these alternate genres? So I think that you really have to dig deep and ask yourself why you want to play this instrument in the first place. Mm. You know, um, I think that I realized that I really wanted to take the horn into a different direction when I was in grad school and I was studying with Zach Smith at the time of PSO. And he told me that he got his assistant horn job, uh, assistant principal job when he was 23. And at the time he was 67 when we started studying. So, you know, I'm a very realistic person, you know, if you want to make a career, meaning you want to make money with playing this instrument and, you know, be able to like pay your rent, feed your kids, that kind of thing, then I feel like versatility is the name of the game. Um, You know, unless you want to, you know, bust your butt for 40 years and wait for somebody to die or retire, Um, (laughs) you know, like the likelihood of you getting into that dream orchestra. And I mean, like every now and then, you know, the opportunities come up, you know, I think the um, the principal of the Cleveland Orchestra right now is like really young, Nathaniel. Mm-hmm. He's like really young. So like he, a- awesome player. I mean, to you have to be great. You have to be, have to practice, but it's just like, yeah. So, I mean, like thinking about what you want to do and why you want to do it. And then I, you know, in my opinion, it's like being a good musician first and then a good horn player second. That is going to make the possibility, the possibilities endless for you. You know, like I get classical gigs, I get jazz gigs, I get R&B gigs. I think right before we started airing, we were talking about the roots. I've played with the roots before. I never dreamed that I would do something like that, Mm -hmm. you know, but being at the right place, of course, at the right time, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity, but it's just like, you know, you really have to think about why you're doing what you're doing. And of course, it's like, well, I love the French horn. That's always going to be the answer. Yeah, but it's like, you have to have a a thought of of, of, like a logistical way of how you're going to plan out your career and do what you want to do. And also not get burnt out. I think one of the main benefits of delving into other genres is that classical music is just very demanding there is a certain perfectionism about it there is a certain uh, elitism about it too you know when you get into certain crowds and stuff like that so it's just like taking a break from okay i have to like be this way and i have to sit up straight and i have to do all these things because that's what just the culture of the genre is and going to play in a salsa band where everybody is like gyrating, dancing, eating nachos, you know? (laughs) And I mean, like just having a good time, but the musicianship and the demand of it is still at a pretty high level, but the only difference is is that they're enjoying it. It's joyful. Mm -hmm. And again, don't don't get me wrong, classical music, like I cry (laughs) because it's so beautiful. And so because the musicians are, just such at a high level and you can tell they're focused, but they're also enjoying it and they're making this beautiful music. Like there's a bunch of benefits to only being in classical music, but I just feel like you, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't look in other directions too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, for the young horn player, I think that, you know, 
busting out those fundamentals you know you got to start somewhere but then when you have a good handle on that just venturing out into other worlds other genres so that you know you can maintain your sanity <laughs> and you know do something that's fun that feels silly that doesn't feel so structured there's freedom in it and there's so many benefits to doing that and when you come back to the thing where it's like, okay, I have to focus, I have to do these rehearsals and these gigs and stuff like that, you're less stressed. You know, you're not like, oh my gosh, like I'm killing myself over this high E flat. Like, it's just like, you know, it, it, that, that kind of thing. Like you don't, you can remove yourself from that and come back to it. Cause I mean, it has to be done, right? Like it, it does have to be done. If you choose the path, it has to be done, but there are other ways and other worlds and other realms that can free you of some of that stress if you choose to do so. And again, I'm living proof that if you actually take those other worlds serious, that it can benefit you in the long run. I never thought that I would be composing in the way that I'm composing. But when the world shut down, I was faced with something that I'm like, I still have to pay my rent. I still have to, and I still wanted to be submerged in music, but I couldn't play anywhere in front of people. and have that connection with people. So I'm like, well, I'm gonna write stuff for people to play at their homes and write stuff for people to enjoy when they can't have an audience. And so that's how I got into it. So just keeping your possibilities open and just knowing that especially in 2023, there's so many things that you can do when you're a good musician first and a good horn player second. Yeah, I really like that. Good musician first, good horn player second. I think that's universally applicable. Yeah. Shanice, thank you so much for talking to me today. This was just a great conversation. I'm really glad we got to have this chat. Yeah. Thank you everybody for watching. Thank you to our live studio audience. <laughs> Small but enthusiastic. Yes. Um, and thank you all so much again for tuning in. Tune back in tomorrow at nine o'clock or 9.15 again. I think that Peter Curl will be here tomorrow. So that's going to be a ride and a half. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but until then, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And thank you so much again for being here. Bye-bye. <laughs>